Optix has built a platform for SQL-powered security analytics. Extending the OS query agent, Optix collects, aggregates, and analyzes a wide range of system data and makes that available to solve multiple security challenges. Their solution provides visibility across Linux, macOS, Windows, containers, and cloud workloads. Their customers are using the Uptix platform for fleet visibility, intrusion detection, investigation, and audit and compliance. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Uptix and be one of the first to see how they've mapped over 500 behavioral rules to the MITRE attack framework. Cybercriminals are opportunistically targeting industries that continue to operate full tilt during the coronavirus shutdowns, and their attacks have grown more sophisticated. Given this shifting landscape, taking the appropriate countermeasures becomes paramount. Mimecast Email Security 3.0 helps you evolve from a perimeter-based security strategy to one that is comprehensive and pervasive with cyber resiliency in mind. From the company that stops at nothing to block cyber threats, Mimecast is offering a fully featured 90-day web security service. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Mimecast to learn more. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. If you've got a specific guest or topic you'd like us to cover on one of the shows, make sure you submit your suggestions for guests and topics by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guest. We review those on a regular basis uh, and use that to uh, fuel the show. Chris Crowley joins us to discuss the results of his 2020 security operations survey. Chris uh, has been working with computers since he was 15 years old. He currently operates a boutique consulting firm on security operations called Montace LLC. Did I say that right, Chris? No, but that's okay. It's Montance. All good. Montance. Got it. Uh, Montance is a trusted independent information security partner providing cybersecurity assessment framework development services, enabling clients to create a new SOC or improve existing security operations. Chris, it's nice to have you on this particular show. You've been in our shows in the past. Good to have you back. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me back. I must have done something right. <laughs> <laughs> You're all about socks, which is good. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, at least that's your current uh, current focus in, in one of your projects, which is uh, which is great. And as uh, Adrian was just stating, uh, you know, during the break, I think. It might be good, especially to hear from you, Chris, uh, as you're helping clients create new socks. What what is a sock? How is it defined, and how does that differ from how it may be implemented in various organizations? Yeah, it's a it's a question that a lot of people ask. I have uh, a framework that I use for it, but rather than me sharing my opinion, um, I think it's pretty good for me to talk about what the respondents in the sock survey mm. actually said, because that's um, the community information about this. So. SOC, Security Operations Center. Um, some people will use CERT, C-I-R-T, C-E-R-T, uh, certain things that they, uh, that they will name things differently. So the question that I asked in the survey, the 2020 SOC survey was, what capabilities do you have? What do you, you know, you're saying you're a SOC, what things do you offer in terms of services? The big ones, the top five, <clears throat> and there were 20 or 30 uh, that were options in there were Security roadmap and planning, um, security administration, uh, meaning the tools that were uh, that were managed, IT architecture, remediation, and uh, SOC architecture. Those were the top five that were there. And and I also asked this question in terms of: Do you do this internally? Do you outsource it, or do you have some mix of the two? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the charts that I have in the report are. Um, basically the top five type things, but I actually have made all of the charts and all of the response data and all of the um, analysis work that I did available. And that's all the download for that is all linked inside of the, uh, inside of the survey itself. That's sock-survey.com. Yeah, super easy. SOC-survey.com. Very easy to download it. And you can just download it from there and and then uh, the link to the Google Drive for the full response set, de-identified, of course, because I collected people's emails and promised them I wouldn't share them. Gotcha. And, 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 then, uh, and then inside of there is the Jupyter Notebook as well, which is where I did all the, the analytical work and shared that. I will warn you <clears throat> that Jupyter Notebook is sloppy. It's actually the notebook that I used while I was developing all of it. That's so awesome. it's all there, but you may have to kind of like cull through it in order to get to the good parts it's better to have it than not to have it yeah i think that's really agreed cool. yeah and then you know it's like the idea of i want to allow people to um 
formulate their own opinions. A lot of, a lot of times with surveys like this, you get a survey and it just says 26%, 34%, 50%. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, was that 15,000 people or was that four people that you're, you're coming up with like two significant distance of results in your uh, percentage values? So I would rather share that. And because of the way I did the survey this year, it's at my discretion. You know, I can share all of the information and there are no sponsors or anything this year. So it was good. Chris, your, your video seems to have frozen. I don't know if you can uh, uh, how maybe about now? enable it. Disable yeah, I'll it toggle then- it. I'll toggle it and see what happens. Too much. It's okay 4K because the way it froze was picture perfect. It was. Yeah, it tends to freeze oh. on really. Yeah. Now How I about just, now? Now Can I just you see, see it. A, no, now I just see a black screen. Wow. And it looks like you're sitting in the dark. Uh, I do that sometimes, but I guarantee this time. If, if if your screen is going to freeze, you know it, you'll be blinking or you know your mouth will be open or. Yeah, it's <laughs> never a flattering screen freeze. When that mm-hmm. happens, yeah. Now mm-hmm. I see is a black screen. So I turned off HD. Well, you turn know, HD back on. If your screen is going to freeze, a live a live video podcast is the best place to have it freeze, right? Right. <laughs> it's always the way. So yeah, the last time that happened to me, unplugging the webcam and plugging, plugging it, it back, back in worked. But if you're using a laptop, I'm going to assume maybe you can't do that. No, I can do that. Let me uh, let me try that out. Unplug. Live troubleshooting. Plug back in. Boop, boop, boop. In the meantime, Paul will sing us a song and do his little dance. Oh, no. And we got him back. So I spare you my song and dance. Oh, um, I was just going to grab my guitar back here. Right? Just saying. <laughs> I was going to play a, play a song for everybody, but hey, Paul, he's back. I'm okay, so it. normally Paul asks questions at the end. I'm going to ask Paul a question now. If you had to karaoke right now, what song would you sing, Paul? Uh, the Humpty Dance by Digital Underground. <laughs> my wow. one trick pony. Uh, yeah. Over over a beer, Paul. I'll tell you my story of the time I met them and hung out with them. There you go. That's awesome. Uh, Chris, my question for you was, what surprised you most about the survey? Um, <clears throat> so um, what surprised me most... I don't know. It was weird. I I didn't go into it with a lot of expectations, but there was one thing that I sort of developed in the middle of it. And I had this thing where I came up with the tale of two socks, this sort of dichotomy. And to me, I was like, oh, well, clearly funding is tied to this management opinion around the uh, around the socks. And as it turned out, when I went and looked uh, sort of pivoted within the data, the opinion that their management supports them um, and their staffing needs did not appear to be correlated to funding. Hmm. So, so hmm. I took two different questions and said, okay, well, these people say that the, the management understands the needs of a security operations center to have distinct staffing. And then I said, well, that, I mean, obviously they must get better funding than the other people. And then I, and then I, used this the self-reported size of the organization to identify the funding amount that was reported as well. So it was a couple different things that I tied together. And no, it, it was basically with the same budget, the management was either perceived to be supporting them in their hiring challenges or or not. And that that surprised me. It wasn't so much like in the responses, it was a, a conclusion or an, uh, some inference which I drew, mm-hmm. and then I looked for that, and it turned out to be n- not a valid inference. It didn't. It didn't get supported in, in the response set that was there. So a lot of moral support, maybe. Yeah. Well, well, in a way, it's almost like if if you were underfunded and understaffed, at the very least. Um, having people be thankful <laughs> for you showing up. Yeah. And you know what you do. Like at the very least, do that for me, right? You know. <laughs> like, I like that you have data to support that. I think that's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, a, a, an interesting thing. And so, uh, let me just back up. I know most people listening probably haven't read the survey. The survey title for 2020 was "A Tale of Two Socks," because in the responses which came out, one of the questions I asked was, please select the opinion that most accurately represents how human capital is addressed in your environment. And so it was these, this almost equal split in the responses between these, uh, these two different things. 
right? Of either they re- they support us, they get it, or they just don't seem to care. And the you know having analysts looking at a screen all day long is what their vision is for our security operations center. Um, but what I did find um, in this, there was a meaningful difference in a couple of cases. And um, one of the meaningful differences um, was that if, and I'm just going to get to it so I can actually um, cite the, the component specifically, the, the idea was that if the management supported you, most of these people cited the security operations implementation as their top challenge, which the way that I read this, kind of the, the layer of explanation behind what the responses say, is that the people who feel like they have management support are in a technical challenge as their primary thing. Like, let's get this SOAR tool and let's get it deployed. That's what they listed as the top SOC challenge for the people who were saying that they were in the the set of people that their management supported them. Whereas the people who said that their management did not support them, all the things that they talked about as their top challenge was not having staff, not having skillful staff. And so it was almost like with the perception of management support, even without additional funding, their challenge was more of a, how do we make this stuff work? As opposed to being upset about the the ongoing kind of personal, uh, um, personnel aspect. So again, if if I'm giving guidance to management, one of the things that I would say is, based on these responses, at the very least, make people feel like they're valued and you'll probably get more value from their efforts, at least from what they're reporting to people like me when I ask them for anonymous survey information. How many how many people did you survey, Chris? This this year it was only about a hundred, um, which is down from what I've done in the previous years. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this this year there were um, this year I did it independently. So in previous years I've had corporate sponsors and other Mm. stuff. Sands Institute uh, is basically who organized it. uh, And they decided not to do it this year. Um, So that actually created kind of, um, I think, this is one of the reasons why I think it was a lower turnout, is I just don't have the marketing reach that, uh, you know, Sands Institute and a bunch of other vendor sponsors have when they're pushing that out there. So, And was there... um data about how you measure the effectiveness of the SOC and, you know, if, if so, or if not, you know, what are your thoughts on, I mean, cause that's a, yeah. I mean, we could do a whole segment really just on that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's actually a ton of stuff um, that we could kind of pick apart. And this is the other reason why I'm sharing the responses is that if other people want to do derivative analysis uh, type work, have at it. The mm-hmm. the raw set of responses are there. You can grab my um, my notebook. I know as an example, um, and I'll answer your question in just one second, sorry. But no, as, no. as an example, I was talking to um, uh, some folks in South America and they were kind of like, oh, well, what can you tell us specifically about South America? And I said, I haven't done that, but you can use code that I already have in the Jupyter notebook to focus on any given region. So you could basically say, show me all the stuff of all of these um, plots that he's already done, but only show me South America or headquarters has to be Europe or headquarters has to be Europe and operations in North America. Like that code is there already if you want to do that sort of subsequent um, pivoting inside of it. So your question was, how do people discuss effectiveness and the and the approach that um, a lot of people take in order to discuss effectiveness is metrics. And so there was a question, um, there were actually uh, basically a couple of questions, but um, are metrics provided was one of the questions. Do you provide metrics to your management to support your SOX capabilities and effectiveness was mm-hmm. the way the question was phrased. This isn't surprising to me, but Roughly a third of the people, 24 responses straight up said, no, mm. right, no, we don't do that. That's interesting. <laughs> and, and, and I think about that and I'm like, if, if your organization's spending, uh, I don't know, I think the, the lowest, the lowest budget number was in like the hundred thousand dollar range. If your organization's spending a hundred thousand to $8 million, which is what like the higher end of the range was in budgeting, 
if if I were spending that money on behalf of an organization, I'd at least expect some metrics. Yeah. Right. Show me something. Show me what you're doing. And so the the top metrics that were reported, um, and uh, these this is the top five list: number of incidents. Mm-hmm. Which were which were experienced, um, the time to detect, time to contain, time to eradicate, um, that was all that was all bunched into one sort of category. Uh, the time to discover all the assets affected, uh, the threat intelligence attribution. I was I was fascinated by that. That made mm. the top five hmm. a mm. metric related to attribution. Of threat intelligence information, and then the last one, which made the top five, which also I thought was an, actually an awesome metric to include, was the thoroughness of eradication. Now, if if I'm if if it were up to me, if you were running a SOC and you were reporting to me, and you were reporting the number of incidents to me, I'd be like, I kind of don't care about that. How yeah. does that tell me? How does that tell me how? If you're doing well, it's literally but just a number. <laughs> it's just a number, and <laughs> yeah. and it, fine, collect it, track it, um, but it doesn't tell me. Uh, was were we supposed to have ten this quarter? Were we supposed to have sixty? <laughs> right. Did you miss fifty, right, or did right. you find ten that you hadn't seen before? Like I, I don't know how that expresses value, but like mm. thoroughness of eradication, I kind of like that. It's like you said that you fixed it, but you didn't. <laughs> yeah, or it came back, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you said that you fixed it and you didn't. I don't I don't want that. That's a that's bad performance. So good performance would be you're always thorough in your eradication when you say that it's out. It's out. Mm. I like yeah. the evaluation of the threat intelligence though, cuz I think what I like to think is that we've been evangelizing that notion for some time and people have mm-hmm. really caught on to go threat intelligence isn't a bad thing if you use it correctly. And one yeah. of the things we've said in the context of those conversations is make sure you scrutinize it and relate it back to things in your environment. So I'm happy to see that metric on the list. Me too. Mm. Yeah, me too. I really like that one. I really like that one. I think that the time stuff is good. I mean, it's a way to judge uh, performance. The only the only fear that I have around time to this, time to that, is what it implies to the analyst is go fast. Yeah. Whereas... I want quality first right. and then speed. So it there's n- I do like the eradication thoroughness and the threat intel attribution because those are quality measures rather than time measures. It just makes me concerned when I see time to detect without some corresponding quality of detection right. metric represented. Adrian? So so I, I did a SOC survey um, a few years back with uh, Scientia Institute and and coming up with those metrics, um, yeah, I think that was that was something that came back was, uh, you know, like like we we needed better ideas for metrics, you know that we we didn't, you know, time is, I think a lot of people are using time just because it's it's easy to come up with, you mm-hmm. know, and they just uh, haven't thought about it long enough or or hard enough to to come up with better metrics, but on the ones that say they don't have. A metric, you know, I suspect they do have a metric. It's just, um, it's not something that they actively think of. You know, it's probably like the the button seat metric, right? Like they get some comfort out of knowing that there are people sitting in chairs looking at screens, which is why often in a lot of businesses, uh, you know, you have what they call the fishbowl, where the the uh, the operators, you know, like like that's why there's a big pane of glass. Uh, showing into the knock or the sock or something like that. And and you have all these stuff that nobody actually uses, you know, like the PPU maps, uh, you know, it's just there for the tour. Um, mm-hmm. So I suspect that's a metric for a lot of people. Like, like they're simply getting the, you know, the warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that there are people sitting doing in chairs, stuff. looking at things. Yeah. They, they don't know if mm-hmm. it's doing any good or not, you know, but you know, there's some value in being able to show the board of directors or, you know, whoever's whoever's coming through, look, there's people in there and they're doing things. Yeah, I and I and I I the compliance sock is what that feels like to me. You are funding this thing because there's some mandate which you must have monitoring. And the subsequent detection and very high quality performance costs more money 
Uh, so you, you don't really focus on that as an objective. The other challenge with that is doing it really well. That also takes a lot of complexity and business alignment and sometimes even change of organizational culture to integrate security into the rest of your IT practices. Like you were saying earlier on the news reel, where it's like getting away from cyber this or cyber that and just becoming IT means security embedded across all of the components of it that that takes a lot of work and sometimes implies change so not all organizations in fact want that um, one one other thing related to it is the idea of a managed security service provider the mssps love those fishbowl meeting rooms with the smoked glass that they can just like <laughs> mm. you know i've i've been in a couple i've been in a couple really amazing um, large scale um, socks from huge telecom providers. And, <laughs> you know, they'll bring you into this meeting room and there's the mirrored wall. And then at some yeah. point they like fade that out and you see this, this huge room of people that are actually looking at the, uh, their monitors. And it's, it's great. That, that has a big impact. And if I were an MSSP who were responsible for selling services to people, I'd probably use that well factor to my advantage too. I mean, it doesn't enhance the security; it just enhances the sales. And sure, as we know, that's part of the deal. You know, yeah. Big client coming in today. Did somebody pick up the dry ice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And actually, it's interesting. I, you know, I do. I I just work for myself, and I do a small number of customers at any given time. I actually have a customer who I, you know, recently contracted with to help them with a new big customer for their MSSP capability to help to make sure that this customer got sort of like, you know, whatever you want to call it, white glove, gold level, whatever sort of service level, they basically brought me on as an expert to help to make sure that that was happening um, just so they had all of their bases covered to help to onboard that, uh, that customer. That's a challenge for MSSPs. It's like, I can't get my customer to even tell me what they want. <laughs> yeah. Half the time, that's that's the MSSPs dilemma. The customer doesn't yeah. know. So they need they need help discovering. And it's it's strange. Different customers for MSSPs want different things. I actually had MSSP related things uh, in the metric as well in the survey, which says, what are the things that your MSSP is giving you? as a uh as a uh, a, a metric. metric yeah right so, so oh, hold on tyler chris, yeah chris i have a quick question for you on uh, uh this is me understanding i guess the space a little bit um mm -hmm. what's the difference between say security operations and security engineering in an expert's uh eyes like yours right and before you answer it i'll give you my probably incorrect color um, where security operations is kind of the day-to-day -day operating on security things, right? And that runs mm -hmm. out of a security operations center. The mm -hmm. automating, the taking it to the next level, the turning what used to be more manual processes potentially into fully automated, engineered and integrated solutions, that's SEC engineering. And then the follow-on question, assuming that my description is correct, please correct me if it's not, but if, if it is correct, is that driving some of the move from having and running your own SOC into a true MSSP is the ability to find talent around security engineering? Okay, so um, that's a, a good, it's a really good topic to discuss because it, it addresses the ideas of um, the underlying operations of the SOC itself versus the notion of providing security architecture as a service from within the SOC. So I want to I want to take what you said, and I agree the idea that engineering is the notion of making things um, better operationally. Um, for security aspects of our IT systems. But I would also sort of add the shading of how I discuss this where I can engineer the solutions for the SOC itself. I can also engineer the security aspects of the IT systems which are operating on behalf of the business. Okay, so are you with me so far in terms of the question and, and me trying to oh, sure. sort of... Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, so there are two different engineering tasks 
um, and engineering and architecture. I, I'm going to sort of glom them together in terms of what I'm about to say, right? Um, because the architecture is understanding the design needs and then the engineering is um, actually designing and, and, um, and deploying the thing that is needed to suit the design needs. So the architecture is sort of is a superset of the, of the engineering aspect. Um, and then you also ask the, the, the portion of our companies essentially aspiring to become MSSPs. And there's actually um, a question in the survey. Let me see if I can find it real quick to answer it. But there's a question that basically says, is your SOC offering uh, an obligatory offering or are you as an internal SOC um, a service that members of your organization can choose to um, use or not? Um, so I, I talk about that in the uh, in the uh, in the architecture um, of the SOC, uh, and I think that it's so difficult to separate out these various models of what might be in place. Um, and so let me just see if I can find the that question um, because I see few internal SOCs aspiring to become service providers for other organizations, right? I, I just don't see that. Um, it's rare that that will happen. And it's usually a telecom, which has to maintain enough security operations for its own stuff anyway, that they end up transitioning to an, uh, an offering to their customers as well. And I think that cloud uh, components are, are very much the same way. Um, Okay, um, so th let me let me address that particular question. Um, there was 183 is the column number um, for the data set, but it says about according to half of the responses, an internal SOC is mandatory service. Um, and then 35 of the responses, this is out of about 107, um, 107 responses overall, and not every single person answered this particular question, but 52 internal SOC was a mandatory service, and then 35 an internal SOC was an optional service, which essentially means that my company has a SOC, but I don't have to use their SOC service. I could actually go lease something from a, an external MSSP in order to provide this. Now, in larger organizations, I've talked to people where they play this kind of like control game and they use the SOC as the mechanism for that control. I also, and this is stepping outside of this, the survey response stuff and more into my SOC class kind of um, architecture around security operation centers. Uh, I, I also talk about the notion of um, multi-SOC architectures, because in bigger places, this is what tends to end up happening where they have um, one, one strategy is they'll do a regional basis of we've got our APAC SOC, um, then that covers everything in the Asia region. And it's also like Oceania and New Zealand and Australia and everything over there. Then we have our European SOC and then we have our North American SOC and we have our South American SOC. And then the SOCs basically interact, but are responsible for content within their physical geographical domain of um, responsibility. So Did I see that model for like a follow the sun type of type of model. Well, but so then uh, this is a, it's like, that's a really good anticipation of where I was going. And then Sorry. I see other companies using geographical distribution of resources to look at the same content across different time zones in order to have everybody looking at the same data, but using this distributed global model, unless you're a flat earther, right? You know, gl global model of follow the sun <laughs> to be able to just like deal with resource contentions. And the other thing that I've seen people who have done the follow the sun model tend to find is, well, the folks in this region are really good at just doing the care and feeding of the rules and the updates and all that stuff. We'll get them to do that. This other region, they tend to have a lot of spare time. 
they do the hunting. This other region, they tend to have better uh, institutional awareness. They do the use case development. And so what I'll see often in the in the specific locations in terms of the work that is being done, they'll also have specializations based on the regional capabilities which may be present. Yeah. It's awesome. So. It's great research, Chris. Um, I really appreciate you uh, in the kind of open source uh, spirit, putting all this out there for the community. Again, you can find the survey at sock-survey.com. Chris, always yeah. wonderful to have you on our shows. Thanks for hey, joining man. us today. Nice to see you all. Great. Thank you very much for making the time for me. Appreciate it. Outstanding. Uh, let's see. Coming up next, we've got Amit and Ganesh from Optics talking about the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Stay tuned.